Well, good evening. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Montpelier, not far from Mount Hunger. My name is Peter Toms. We acknowledge the creative endeavor, which is Poem City 2023, sponsored by Kellogg Hubbard Library and shepherded so well by Michelle Singer. Some brief housekeeping. We have three bathrooms down on the next floor, down below, two are on this side and one is in the corner of the room. We have an elevator in the back, which anyone is welcome to use. And Bear Pond Books is also here in the far corner with Jess, who has copies of Audrey's book. Given Marjorie's vital and fruitful presence in Vermont for decades, it's tempting to say that she needs no introduction and to sit down. <laughs> Resisting that prospect, a few things come to mind. Marjorie's path has been marked by clarity, commitment, candor, vision, hope, and engagement. All have informed her endeavors in journalism, photography, writing, teaching, and public service. And in all, she has a striking ability to recruit other people. Marjorie has been a writer and poet all of her life, has taught poetry from Middlebury College at the New England Young Writers Conference, for 20 years and has taught poetry for Johnson State College and Dartmouth College. She has served as an award-winning journalist, the editorial director of two publishing companies, a Vermont State legislator, and an award-winning writing professor for Castleton State College. Originally from Philadelphia and a graduate of Beloit College, Marjorie holds a graduate degree in poetry from the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. Speaking of Marjorie's talent to recruit, which in essence is leadership, two projects come to mind. First is the extraordinary 2003 book and project, Water Music, the proceeds of which benefited the UN Foundation to support water as a resource for the earth and its inhabitants. And if you don't know the book, this is what it is. And I would like to take the liberty of reading from one page of this book early on. And it's probably worth showing you if I can manage the physical talent. It's really the, the title page, and here's what the words say. Water music, photographed and orchestrated by Marjorie Ryerson. 66 renowned musicians from around the world celebrate water in words and music. Introduction by Paul Winter. And this is from the University of Michigan. Among those taking part in that project, for example, are Sharon Robinson and Jamie Laredo, Bobby McFerrin, Gordon Bach, Midori, Pete Seeger, Paul Robeson, and Renee Fleming. Imagine. Second, you may know that Marjorie is president of the board of directors of the nonprofit for the Land Publishing, which has put out three volumes of the Vermont Almanac. <coughs> this one, from last fall, pulls together 72 writers, surely evidence of high recruitment skills. Again, speaking to her capacity to recruit others, it's of deep value for the writers for 
for the views from Mount Hunger, Marjorie has enlisted Green Riders Press of Battleboro, Mary Azarian, Mason Singer of Laughing Bear Associates, Madeline Kuhn, Scudder Parker, Archer Mayer, Reeve Lindbergh, Charles Dignor, Robert Ray, and Sidney Lee. To conclude, from E.B. White in Charlotte's Web, 1952, it's not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. <laughs> Please welcome Marjorie and Carl. Before, but as I told him when we started, it was a lifelong dream of mine to have Mason design a book of my poems, and here we did it. And Mary Azarian, who sings in the chorus with me, and um, I'm very proud to have her woodblock print on the cover. It's called November Ravens, and I put a poem about November in because of Mary's art. I would I would like to keep this evening within our time limits, so I want to ask you, if you're inclined to applaud, to hold it until the end, because that will make it go more smoothly. For my opening poem, I would like to read a poem I wrote for my son and his wife Liz. They have just come up this afternoon from Concord, Massachusetts, with my grandchildren Sabine and Kai. This is a poem called Libretto. In the month they first opened hearts to one another, they learned that love comes in layers. The top layer is the music. The top layer is the hydrogen melding with transparent oxygen pouring palpably through thirsty fingers. The top layer is anticipation spreading willingly like tide over rocks. It is hands calling Chopin on the keys. It is touch, eyes. It is sleepless peace. In the weeks in which they each talked alone in the darkness, they learned that the second layer of love is want. It is the precipice of the unknown. It is the search for the familiar in the desert of change. It is the street without houses, a mountain without true north. 
it is trust. In the days in which they shed expectations, in which they let go both of asking and needing, they learn that love's third layer is the in-breath. It is the meadow grass before the animals graze. It is the pond without wind. It is the skeletal self made flesh. The ideal lover lives beside me day and night. Multiple times a day, he gazes at me with deep love, then gently places his forehead against my mouth for a kiss. In the mornings, he moans with longing, gently pressing against me as I awaken. He loves to eat and is consistently grateful for food I place before him. He readily communicates how much he missed me when I come home from a few hours away. He consistently rewards me with gentle, affectionate love. He quietly talks to me throughout each day, his eyes squinting with smiles. His native language is not mine, but I understand everything he says. He has four legs and a long furry tail, my ideal lover. The River's Wisdom. This poem came from a trip I made down the Mississippi River to photograph the river for the water music book. The River's Wisdom. The water twists, twirls, howling forward. This river sucks enough water from springs and storms to keep plummeting its level power beyond every next curve. Whirlpools and eddies, random but constant, shiver the surfaces that spin gold at dawn, that shimmer blue at high noon, that dress in tangled black silk as the new moon ascends the ridge. This river's wisdom is in charge. Even during the crest of April, as snowmelt fattens its blustering core, even in late January, when geometric scored ice seals in the current with winter lace. This river knows what all rivers know. Its language is constant music as it breaks its glass against rocks, thuds its drums against fallen trees, shimmies its slick body under dripping bridges. This river doesn't sing for humans who grope forward, stopping and starting, relying on emails, paychecks, reality TV. This river's wisdom is in its lack of need. This river's wisdom is in attaining harmony, even while thundering. This river's wisdom is in simply being in a place without time. This river's wisdom is in welcoming roots, light, eternity, no questions asked. This river's wisdom is in valuing the life within. Is this mic okay? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Hidden treasures. Why has kindness disappeared over the mountain ridge? Will he ever romp back here and come to visit us again before the sun, as is her habit, slips silently behind the barn? And whatever happened to Honesty, who used to bring her friend Integrity to dinner each day? Honesty used to beg us to shed all the dirty laundry from the chairs so that they could have a seat at the table. Did Caring stop in the meadow to collect wild apples? Surely she will bring some of those fruits back home to share with those of us who are unable to reach into thorns for sweetness. We gave respect the right to open our mail, to hug all our friends, but somehow humans told him that he had to earn his presence 
by doing chores and good deeds for them every day. He finally shrugged and moved to the moon. The elderly Miss Faith was kidnapped centuries ago by religion. She had kept asking humans to trust the gray areas, even if they couldn't see or understand them. When those humans didn't believe that oceans lay at the end of rivers, Miss Faith lay down and died. Trust sat by his ex-wife Pope's bedside and shook as she departed the world. He had once written her memoir, but had never found a publisher to carry the book. Right before her death, Trust hired a lawyer and hijacked Hope's estate. Beauty kept writing editorials for the weeklies, insisting that she wasn't merely a physical presence, but was actually inside people's hearts, reflecting who and what they cared about most. She swore her value was in meaning, not in bathing suit contests. The twins' cooperation and community were each individual hands that composed classical music. The left hand was gifted. She mastered all the keyboard notes. The right hand only wanted to shake other hands and wave at all the cameras. Love, he, she, and they love felt overused and undervalued. Love, the fabric of all living things, kept begging for understanding. Love wanted to be the only language spoken in the world, the one and only doctor who could keep us all healthy. Blending with light. It doesn't matter the words we use, each poem narrates the same story. Each poem attempts to make sense of the jagged past, tries to walk the thin ice of the present. Each poem slips moist fingers into the future, snoops into rooms whose doors are locked. Elsewhere, biologists in antiseptic labs bend over microscopes hoping to discover why words cannot move us closer to our own parched cores. Does it matter that scientists have discovered the genes for risk and uncertainty? Does it change anything if the Big Bang never happened? All we need to know is that when our eyes meet those of the sun and don't shrink away, we fuse with the spirit of a poem. When what we see coalesces with light, we know ourselves at last. The verbs of love. See, recognize, linger, stare, Listen, inquire, explore, wonder, ache, fantasize, shiver, tingle, tremble, touch, plunge, submit, surrender, shimmer, radiate, burn, burst, meld, melt, treasure, become. Breathe, stumble, struggle, cleave, weep, shut down, comprehend, compromise, reach out, surrender, laugh, heal, bond, hold. The Solitude of November. In the meditation known as November, branches shove thin fingers into ashen air. The first snowflakes drift dizzily down in slow motion, as if the clouds are just learning their numbers, 
counting out one plus one makes five. Naked November holds out her bare palms, welcoming the imminent darkness to come. In this month, lanky rivers settle heavily into their beds, unobserved, undisturbed, relieved to hibernate under ice until spring. Humans are hesitant visitors to this ancient month, a time in which Canada geese no longer fly and trees' last starved leaves abandon hope. Everywhere, once vibrant plants have folded at their waists like tired old ladies tying their shoes. It is best to be alone with November, a month whose reward is ample space for breathing, a month that follows toxic heat, brash colors, reckless harvests, and humans struggling to complete their summer chores, racing against clocks that tick too quickly. November spreads her gray silk across damp ground, a carpet for drowsy meadows, for the few who choose to see. The next poem is called Instructions for the Eight Billion, and it is a participatory poem if you want, if you choose. Be still and breathe in. Pull the silky air into your abdomen. Feel yourself fill from your knees to your shoulders. Shut your eyes or allow them to stay halfway open. Allow your mind to empty. Allow your mind to still. Be no more than the air you breathe. Acknowledge your thoughts as though they are strangers passing by on the street. On each in-breath, feel the last century pour into you. It is your inheritance from flapper girls to the Korean War, from the Model T to moon landings, from the parched cornfields of the 30s to AA meetings, from New Orleans jazz to Mr. Rogers to AIDS, all its moments, all its inhabitants are alive in you. They reside in your lungs, each restless commuter, each stalled snowplow driver, each tired biology professor in her lab seeking a new cure, each elementary school nurse doing throat cultures watching the clock. Let them all float away. Cradle your left hand in your right, touching your index fingers at the middle knuckle. Touch the tips of your thumbs together and hold them still. Continue to breathe deeply, slowly, silently count one as you breathe in. One, breathe out. Two, breathe in. Two, breathe out. Three, three, four, Four. Each breath is your legacy for this country, this century, excuse me. Your hope for rainforests, your gift of lessons learned about wars, your anguish for the warming planet. This present moment is all that we have. Breathe it in. Fill your abdomen, your ribs with the roundness of the blue shrouded globe with 14 billion year old stars still traveling away from the Big Bang, still a long way from wherever they are going. Stars still searching for meaning and finding it only in the journey. Now concentrate on your left hand. Let the center of your being be in your left hand. All your power, all your compassion, all your energy is in your left hand. 
Let that energy radiate to the ends of your toes and to each follicle where a hundred thousand hairs grow from your scalp. These breaths belong to you alone, powerful and whole, without compromise. This legacy is yours alone, in the package of your genes, in the wholeness of this moment, in your breath, in your abdomen, in your light. I live in Randolph, as most of you know, and I walk a lot around the town, and there was one street in Randolph called School Street, and this poem came from walking up and down School Street many times <coughs> and looking at what was there. The man who litters School Street. I've named him Ralph, the man who litters School Street. I know him from the inside out. He smokes parliaments one after the other after the other. He sips vodka in small airline bottles, two bottles per block. He crumples McDonald's wrappers into wads the size of a cat's head because they fly farther across the green lawns. He pitches his Coke cans above driveways with an inch of soda left in them because then the brown foam sprays in the sunlight from the mouth hole as the sparkly cans gyrate in the air. Ralph cruises School Street, heaving his prized rubbish across waiting lawns like Nureyev doing cartwheels above an open stage. The items spin from his barely opened pickup window in a perfected arch. At home, she nags and whines. The hall floors are crunchy with last winter's mud. The unwashed dog barks constantly. But out here on School Street, Ralph's the boss. His paper plates spin out the truck windows, flip-flopping freely in the stiff wind, announcing freedom. Ralph swerves his truck onto the shoulder each time he heaves his empty bud lights. His truck slowly leaks oil like a dream's afterthought disturbs the waking hours. The hue of Ralph's skin is orange due to all the fritos. The truck's exterior is rust and indigo. It's a 94 Chevy that Ralph dragged from a dead farmer's field. The tires still slosh with water, but the goddamn thing drives right. You hear it coming. Wild turkeys take flight from the growl of the lost muffler. There is nothing shy about Ralph. Things not to lose. Car key, cell phone, court case, door key, dog, dinner, charge card, checkbook, curiosity, birth certificate, breath, balance, instruction manual, individualism, relevance, job, drinking water, awe, love, glove, youth, music, laughter, luggage, hair, underwear, time, teeth, health, Hearing, happiness, humor, humility, honesty, electricity, ethics, vacation, voice, gratitude, a healthy planet, sensation in hands or feet, diction, predilection, friends, forests, Tennis game, optimism, intuition, house, sleep, parking space, exercise, knack, nerve, dry land, the chance to explore. P. 
peace, purpose, questions, way, innocence, mind. How to write a poem that is brief. Pick a topic like describing a leaf. Don't attempt to write a poem about grief. Avoid any poems describing a thief. While you're at it, skip having a motif. And be sure to stay away from comic relief or poems about the Great Barrier Reef. Instead, write a poem about corned beef or else craft a poem about a handkerchief. And don't dare show your finished piece to your favorite editor-in-chief. A few years ago, I went to the Boston Symphony to hear that amazing symphony perform the last complete symphony that Gustav Mahler composed, his Ninth Symphony. He was 49 when he started writing it, and he was 50, he was 50 when he died, completed the piece. And in the first movement of that symphony, his five-year-old daughter died. And you hear that grief in the music as he was writing it. And by the fourth movement, Mahler himself was dying. As a result, that symphony is a very emotional piece of music. As I sat in the Boston Symphony Hall, my eyes filled with tears while listening to the performance, as did those of most of the rest of the audience and even the conductor. I felt as if Mahler was standing on the stage and through sound was telling me his stories. So I listened over and over to recordings of the symphony when I returned home to Vermont. And then I wrote four poems, one for each movement. And today I'm going to read you the first and the fourth. And it's, as you can imagine, a fairly abstract project to do, to lie on the floor and listen, as I did repeatedly, to listen to music and think, what is the story that the music is telling me? Andante Comedo from Mahler's Ninth Symphony, First Movement. Inside Mahler's folded chest is a spruce branch heavy with snow, bowed and still, pinned against the hard ground by its own weight. Even now, Mahler's battered heart longs to shed its needle burdens, longs to empty blood from veins, to dance unencumbered by clothes or bones, to transform branches into barn swallows ascending into the sky. Mahler bends to weave his layers of history together into lace, hoping to give the story's purpose at last. He throws his ruddy fingers across absent decades, but his heart has lost its voice, silenced by the death of his small child, by glimmers of his own twilight in the dense unknown. Mahler opens the doors toward empty stage, dragging branches behind him. Empty chairs line the room. Tables are folded against the wall. The wood floors shine. The windows glisten with rain. Suddenly, the room is a flutter with bright blue that lifts effortlessly as the anthem, anth the anthem of vit vit susir, vit vit susir is heard behind. And as most of you know, I'm sure, Mahler was Austrian, and the national bird of Austria is a barn swallow, and it, its cry is vit vit susir. Molto adagio, Mahler's Ninth Symphony, Fourth Movement. Across the hushed crust of snow, feeble light sketches pencil shadow that shudder when the wind fragments the landscape with its mean breaths. The hours are like the shadows, like the wind, irretrievable. We try, but cannot clutch them to our chests. 
The darkness from which we flee is indistinguishable from us. The darkness does not ask for meaning. It seeks nothing, just as grief does not judge, does not negotiate, does not know its own name. And when death puts out its furry palms and devours all in its path, our final whispers come from high in the throat. We are no longer noun, we are verb, flailing, fading, metamorphosing into timorous laments, into transparent memory, into unsuspecting geese flying north, we are ephemeral echoes of moonlight vibrating in the wind, just beneath the horizon, beyond sight, beyond sound. Body, mind. Every day, Body, the obedient sixth grader, does exactly what she is told. She sits up straight, follows all directions. She stays quiet while teacher talks, always keeps her iPad near. She gets her homework done on time, her science essays polished, her fractions correct, her skill builder words memorized, her chocolate desserts shared. Mind is the benevolent dictator in Body's life. He oversees her from his throne, raises his voice sternly if he is displeased, keeps support staff on alert, orders the $200 Merlot. Mind knows how to dip gray neurons into the waters of curiosity and how to flip quickly through the morning news. If Mind wants to be entertained, he orders a rocket to the moon. He flies first class. He insists on the detour to Mars. Meanwhile, Body keeps her sugar intake low. She gets A's in French class. She gets eight hours of sleep each night and wears clean undies. She never forgets her veggies. Teacher insists that Body obey Mind's commands. But today, Body's front row seat is empty. Is she ill? Body wouldn't play hooky. But neighbors saw Body flee the back door and ascend the mountain behind the school. She was wearing pink corduroys and no shirt, her legs and torso dancing. Mind is called on the hotline. He calls in the law. Law orders Body back to the school, insisting she obey her P's and Q's that she salute the flag. But Body only dashes farther up the mountain she sings with the birds. Her grin melts nearby snowfields and shines light into valleys. It looks like Body is growing wings. How can this be? Is that Body who now hollers through a bullhorn, announcing to the world that she is in love, that she alone rules? Could it be that Body is now shredding her lifetime contract with mind? Letting the paper contract float away, carried by the soft wind that reliably wipes the mountains clean. The W's of 2020. And yes, I wrote this in 2020. <clears throat> in isolation, we use fewer words. We watch winter and wine. We wash down more whiskey, more wine. We wear winter PJs weeks at a time. We watch the weather while we whisper at walls instead of wasting our time on wacky websites. We wonder what makes weekends different from weekdays. We wistfully recall work. We wave at friends across the way and wish we were walking with them. We jam wet wood into stoves, hoping to warm ourselves. We wear out our water pipes while washing our hands. We wander wrecked through wasted days. 
We wilt over worsening warnings. We whimper. We watch. We wait. We ask when. We wait longer. We worry. We grow weary. We withdraw. We take walks. We weep. Harvest. At last, I am shaking my own hands, opening them to a brightly lit silence that is nothing more, nothing less than sacred music. I am finally hearing the chords playing for me, louder than all the shoes hurrying across China, louder than all the BMWs in East Hampton. I am sifting this harvest through my fingers. It will fill me for years with wheat and fruits, with clear, clean waters. My arms gather the harvest of fears, fears of stepping off the edges of mountains, fears of failed dreams of restless, lonely nights beside troubled highways, fears of dying, fears of being alive, my hands assemble the harvest of loss, loss of parents, loss of children, loss of hope. I am culling the nutrients of my decades, rubbing them into my skin, holding them under my tongue. I wake to this music and know that intimacy means touching fingers with those who have shared a single measure, an entire symphony. Night's Breath. I wonder if night's breath plays its flute to the stream, inspiring dreams in sleeping fish or if the stream stretches its sparkling fingers around miles of its own violin while night above leans heavily down, pulling the bed covers over its head. I wonder if the dying cedars lining the street banks bend toward their gyrating reflected images, or if instead the water dances upward toward star tree roots, offering its song as nourishment as well as hope. I wonder if the percussions of time ask the vibrations of instant gratification to dance while the stream plays its piano and sheds tears, or if the vibrations challenge the percussions to determine who is stronger, wiser, kinder, more enduring. I wonder if the fireflies see anything but themselves conquering the dark, and if they assume the powdered sugar of stars is merely their own reflection illuminating another night as it seeps in above distant mountain ridges. As Peter said in my introduction, I have taught for 20 years at the New England Young Writers Conference, and it's all 17-year-olds studying, studying all kinds of writing. I was teaching poetry, and I worked on my students to use all their sensory perceptions, not just what they saw, and also to use metaphor. And the students would say, why wouldn't I just say my mother's fat? You know, why would I say she was like an overstuffed suitcase? So I wrote this poem and read it to 150 17-year-olds. Um, it's called Some Men Kiss. Some men kiss like backhoes preparing the backyard for a swimming pool. Others kiss like sparrows clinging to the telephone lines, their claws ripping the wire, hanging on for dear, dear life. Some kiss like Harleys blasting over the terrain, spraying dust that obliterates the sun and burns the eyes. Some kiss like children, kneeling beside their beds, thanking God for mommy and daddy. Some kiss like math, 
the chapter on tangents, followed by the chapter on integral equations, expecting all formulas to balance in the end and the answers to be either right or wrong, expecting to earn straight A's. Some kiss like moths on a screen door, their dusty wings pinging the rusty metal in an involuntary dance with death. Some kiss like toothbrushes, inspired to clean every crack, massage every gum. Some kiss like vultures working the carcass of the deer, snipping at sh with sharp nibbles at soft, available flesh. Some kiss like a long night's sleep after a drunken night out with the boys, settling their bodies down heavily, losing consciousness, their lips bench pressing 500 pounds. Some kiss like super glue, mending shards of a broken vase, the glue stronger than the vase, a glue to last 10,000 years. Some kiss with tongues of river bottoms, some kiss with tongues hard as studded tires in January, some with jackhammer tongues, urgently broadcasting Morse code. As you can imagine, I became rather famous that year when I read that <laughs> Like, wow, you've kissed a lot of men. And the first student that said that to me, I said, no, I wrote as a study of metaphors and, then, and similes. And, and then after that, I went, yeah, what do you think? <laughs> the house windows. The house windows have been clothed in mourner's black for more than five hours while my four-poster bed has been singing a love song to me, telling me how lonely it is for the weight of my warm body pressed against its mattress. My bed has been crooning to me, don't turn on the lights, don't check the time, don't think about the return email you did not write to that long ago friend. Don't consider going back downstairs to shove yet one more log into the wood stove. Don't worry that you never got all the dishes in the sink washed. Come, please come, it moans. Come, slide your soft body horizontally into my arms. Let me hold you and love you. Shut your eyes and trust that while I hold you, you will forever know peace. The bed then gets down on its knees and proposes marriage. It whispers my name with a familiar timbre, then spreads itself gently beneath me. <clears throat> love is, love is ice cream, the ad reads. But no, love is watching Tyrone Brown dance with his bass on the stage while beside him, Max Roach smiles like a new father. Love is Bach's relentless passion pumping across Vermont, the radio's tiny red on light, the only color in the darkness, as a pitch sky cups the frozen landscape. Love is the details, the story of John cradling his injured son, the story of Bill and Beth and Whitney in separate exotic countries for one long afternoon, wanting, above all else, each other. Love can get sticky when its prisms send rainbows down ancient paths and its promises fail to materialize. Love doesn't amount to much when it comes tailor-made, ordered from the love catalog, or if it gets cut as a deal, a this for a that. Love isn't love, if it emanates outward without a core. Sometimes power or money are mistaken as love. Sometimes love is merely a safety net. But this morning, love is belonging. Love is the blue papered living room with its decades of memories. Love is a safe place for the dog to run bedrooms where all our lives have slept, a wood stove that holds its coals overnight, bookshelves where the opera summaries 
are still on the top right, and the atlases still sit beside the poetry books. Love is the honor we extend to the rooms that hold us. Love is the embracing of the fabrics, colors, people, and memories of our choosing. Love is a letter from Elmore, a phone call from Walcott. Love is a day of warm sunlight in winter when we realize we finally turned the corner towards spring, surviving the last sub-zero morning for another season. The highest wall. The highest wall ever built across our path is made from the rugged material called grief. When you get there, reach out, touch it, intimately explore its barbed surface with your tender fingers. Accept its imprint on your body. Acknowledge that this wall will forever alter your path forward. Know that this wall will shape new directions for your life, but also know that when you arrive at the wall, you will find community there. You will never be alone at the wall. We are all there with you. And for my last poem, I'm gonna, this is my final poem of the reading, I'm going to read a poem called Music Doctors. The world unravels, burns, and shreds in ways none of us have imagined and in ways none of us knows how to repair. Yet healing tears flood our cheeks as box BWV 974 Adagio saturates the room. Massenet's meditation Adagio also raises the rivers of our soul's gardens, as does Arvo Part's Spiegel im Spiegel. Music doctors are as old as the human race. These healers drench us with the only medicine that truly cures, medicine that numbs our agony so that we can go on. Thank you, my favorite music doctor. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>